starting with your exam. And so I hope you got a chance to pick up your exam. If you, if you haven't got a chance to pick it up, please uh, head over there. They're in alphabetical order in groups of five. You'll see the letters there. Uh, grab your uh, exam there. And uh, let's go over it and uh, as quickly as I, as I can, but also hopefully answering as many questions as possible because I also have a lot to cover in our next chapter of our thermal dynamics. And we are going to get into some thermal dynamics that you have not yet seen. I know that the stuff we've done so far you have seen, but now for some new stuff. Although the first half is still old stuff, so we still got some more reviewing to do. Anyways, let's look at this test. I'll start with your scores. Uh, you'll notice that at the bottom of every right, of right hand corner I always grade it on a 20 point scale. And I didn't want to change that because I'm so used to breaking a, a part of a problem and saying okay minus two if they did cosine instead of sine and you know. So I've got these different procedures that, that I like. So I kept it on a scale from 20. The only problem with that is it's half a test it's supposed to be out of 50. So if you'll take your bottom right hand score on all three of them, add them together, and if you did everything right you got 60. Uh, so you're going to need to multiply that by 5 sixths and that's what I did. And on your second page you will see that. You will see your total um, then multiplied by 5 sixths. That should be it. So double check my math. That's what you should also see on the website. So I hope this weekend you also got the email from me that said, hey, the scores are, are posted. I did that was it Sunday or Saturday night, something like that? And uh, must not have been early Saturday, but late Saturday, I, I, I got it, finally got it done and got it posted there. Um, anyways, and also I should say keep that link because obviously you have three more tests, a final exam, lots of homeworks, lots of labs, and you're going to want to keep referring to that link, and eventually your your grade will will be there. <coughs> Looking at the exam then, and keeping in mind my my grading scale is. If you can get greater than 73%, that'll get you, well, maybe I should put it this way. That'll get you a B. Uh, because remember, if you get 73 or higher on the test, you add then your homeworks and your labs, which hopefully you've done them all and they're graded on completeness and an effort try, so you got 100% there. That will give you above 80%. So that's a big number that you should always keep in, in mind there. And so look at your test right now. If you're above 83%, you're, you're uh, doing, uh, doing well. The same thing, I guess, applies to an A. It's obviously a little higher and a little harder to get an A. You've got to get up to 86%. Uh, uh, um, I guess I skipped over the C. Uh, that's a 47 percent. And uh, hopefully, I didn't check the lowest score, but hopefully um, somewhere in there. The median score came out to a 39.2 uh, percentage-wise. Uh, what is that? Does that make a 78.4? And so the median score is, you know, right there on that high 70s, mid 80s. Uh, and so half of you are 80s or 90s and the other half's kind of lower than that. Uh, far more than half then are above that B line. Uh, let's look at some of the problems here. Well, let's look at all the problems. I'll start with number one. I'll do it in general like we did the other ones and then you can put in the numbers for your individual test here. But it's got three parts to it. Hopefully you notice this on all the tests that the first parts were identical to the home, well, nearly identical to a homework ones. And then the last part was that original thinking. And on this first one in particular, uh, one and two were right what we did in class C though, I should say A and B were in class C, uh, is going to ask you to do some original thinking. But let's go through this. The first one, A said take a spring, spring constant K, hook a mass M, what's the period? And so hopefully you just begin by writing it down. You could re-derive it as some as you did and that's fine. Or you could memorize it, that's fine too. I 
didn't really care. The derivation is going to come up in C anyways. That's really what C was all about. How did you uh, derive this? Um, but in our case, you were then asked to calculate the mass. You were given the spring constant. You were given the, the period. I'll do the green sheet here. Came out to be point. 142 kilograms for the green sheet. I'll let you do the numbers if you missed that one. I can't recall anybody missing that. Oh yeah, there was someone who calculated it wrong. They wrote out the equation right but calculated it wrong. But most of you got that right off the bat here. What is the mass needed? Now, B of this problem added a little more to it. You still had that mass, or a different mass. That was the question, how much mass? But now you took two springs and hooked them together in series. And if you remember from class, we went through this derivation to say that the equivalent spring constant comes by adding the reciprocals. Don't just add them together. Uh, many of you did add them together. If you had them hooked together in parallel, like this, then we would have K1 plus K2. That's what you get when both springs are hooked to it. Either on the same side or opposite side, if you remember that from chapter 15 in that lecture. This is a little different. And so this comes out to be an equivalent spring constant of K divided by 2, not K multiplied by 2. So that was probably the common wrong answer. But other than that, it's exactly the same. And so you would put it into here and work out what the mass is. And in the interest of time, I will just put down the number for the green sheet and then you guys can do pink or yellow, I think, and plug that one in if you need any help or if you want to know the answer, just raise your hand. I got the answers for the other ones here. But that seemed to go pretty well. And by the way, that was, I decided to make that 15 of the 20 points right there. Um, with the idea that if you did that much, that would put you above the 73, that would get you the B. But to go the next step, to get the A, you got to do at least part of this next part right. Um, and that is what happens when you then take a meter stick and attach the spring some distance D out. Well, it's going to oscillate. And this question was the same also. Where do you have to put that spring in order to oscillate at a certain period? The green sheet says a period of 0.85. And so here's where our mechanics come into play. And here's where our derivation comes into play. Because we didn't do anything exactly like this. You did have a homework one that had a rod and gravity. This one we don't need to worry about gravity. This is actually even easier than that homework one. Because if you think about the center of mass, the center of mass is at the pivot point. So when you go to calculate the torque, there is only the torque caused by... I'll get rid of that. There is only the torque caused by gravity. I mean, sorry. There's only the torque caused by the spring. There is not an additional torque caused by gravity. And a lot of you had mg somewhere in your equation um, for m numerous reasons. One of them is you just did the physical pendulum that we derived in, in class, which Please remember, the physical pendulum only had gravity. We hung it vertically and we swung it back and forth. Gravity was the restoring force. In this case, the restoring force is the spring and not gravity. So it's not at all that same omega that we worked out for the physical pendulum. And a lot of you put omega there, so, I mean, for the physical pendulum. There's no mg in, in here. Don't, don't, don't make that mistake. And I know it's real easy. You have an equation. It looks the same. You want to plug and chug, but it's only going to get you so far and you're only going to do okay. And you're going to get an okay grade and transfer to an okay school and have an okay career. Yeah. You, you need to go back to the fundamentals on this one and, and derive this one. And I tried to set it up so that it wasn't too hard and I, but different. And I thought this would be a good one. No gravity is needed in this one. But the spring is. And that's a big piece. And in fact, if you kind of think about the motion of this spring here as it goes back and forth, 
and we call x this arc length, then x would be the angle times the radius. And so there's our arc of our circle. And so if I put that in, I get minus k and a d squared i alpha, which means I get a minus k d squared over i equals the second derivative of theta. Oh, I forgot my theta there. But that was the key lesson in chapter 15. Write out an equation where you would have the second derivative of something is equal to a negative, that something, and that something out in front then must be omega squared. And therefore the period, which is 2 pi over omega, in this case, would be the square root of i over kd squared. And the i was given to you. The moment of inertia of a rod about its center is 1 12th, and that's the derivation. So you were supposed to put in your period, which on the green one was 0.85, another one had one second, and another one had Oh, the other two had one second and this one had 0.85. Um, but you know the mass that's given, you know the spring constant, uh, you just don't know D, and you know it's one meter long, it's a meter stick, and so you should be able to get D. And so on the green sheet, it was 0.266 meters. 0.2 on the pink one and 0.186 on the yellow one. Well, let's do the next problem. I'll go over to the pink sheet for the next one. Here is our Doppler effect. This is number two. We do have one object moving. This is the bat. The bat is making sound at 20,000 hertz, 20 kilohertz. It is chasing a moth, what I called moth A, because there is later in the problem, the hard part, another moth off in some direction. But for A and B, again, straight out of the homework, I hope you recognize this one. We didn't have a bat and a moth in the homework, but we did have a, uh, didn't we have two ships on a river or a creek or something, you know, and one was producing sound and then the creek was, uh, or the river had a, had a current to it. That's really the same thing because this asked for what frequency does the moth hear as this bat is in pursuit and hunting the moth? And so that was our Doppler effect. We talked about the speed of sound, we talked about the speed of the observer, the speed of the source. So in this particular problem, we have this first step which is what is the speed of our sound waves. And then hopefully you noticed that the beginning part gave you the temperature. It said, in this one on the pink one, it says on a cold night the temperature is 12 degrees Celsius. Um, it's a little different on the other ones. I think the green one here was a warm night at 25 degrees Celsius and the yellow one was a colder night at 8 degrees Celsius. But somewhere in there it gave you the temperature. So on the pink one I get a speed of 338 meters per second. So I would put in 338 here and 338 there. Now the first one is the observer, so the moth is the observer in this case. We need to know the speed of the moth. And in this case, it is a 5. And the source is the bat in this case. And on the pink sheet, the bat is moving at 10. And of course, the green ones and the yellow ones have slightly different numbers. But I'll let you put in your numbers or you can ask me and I'll give you that. The other thing that I think is even tougher than just putting in those numbers since that is one of those just plug and chug steps there, is the plus and minuses. What sign do you use? 
And if you remember this discussion, a moth, something flying away, is going to get a lower frequency. So how do we get smaller frequencies? We have a negative. And so we put negatives when the observer was moving away. On the other hand, in this case, the source is moving towards it. So that's going to change the frequency. And in this case, we are moving towards it. And again, moving towards would make the frequency higher. And to make the frequency higher, we need a negative sign for that one, too. So remember, those signs were in reverse. And uh, so that would be your first calculation. So then if I multiply it by the original frequency coming from the bat, the 20,000, I will get a new frequency. And for the pink sheet, it increases it by 300 hertz. So 20,304.88. And I put on there for two decimal places. I didn't really mean that. I really meant four significant figures, but whatever. I put that on there, so I'll do what I said, two decimal places, all right? But as you'll see, some of these other frequencies change, and I wanted to see the change, one, two, three, four, so I wanted to make sure you really at least have four significant figures, so you can see some change. Anyways, that was A. B, again, like he did on the homework, we add to this. And in this problem, the wind is blowing. On the pink sheet, the wind is blowing to the left at 7 meters per second. I think all of you have wind blowing to the left and just some other number here. And how do you handle that? And again, you did that one for the boat when the uh, current was flowing. You can look at this in two ways. You can look at it as how does it affect the speed of the sound in the air which personally is not the way I like to look at it. I like to look at it as how does it affect the perceived motion of the observer and the source. In other words, let's say I was not moving. Either I'm the bat or the moth, but if I'm not moving. And if the wind is blowing at 7, right, and it's blowing, well, let's see, in that picture, to the left, so the wind's blowing this way, wouldn't, but I'm not moving, wouldn't that be the equivalent of no wind and me flying to the right at seven? And so for me, I like to think as the wind being an additional speed. It's, it's, it's my headwind. I mean, I'm only moving over the ground at five. But the wind is seven more into my face. And so that's equivalent of enough air going by as being 12. It's as if I was flying with, with 12. And so that's, I think, the best approach to the problem. And then likewise, the same thing can be said about the movement of the bat. The bat is already going 10. But there's an additional seven due to the headwind. In other words, if the bat wasn't moving, it would just be seven. It would be the equivalent of 7 to the right. But now with the additional movement of the bat, it's, it's 17. And so if you put those numbers in, you did the majority of the problem. And in this case, the frequency becomes a smaller change. Not much. And now you can see why I was after two decimal places as measured in kilohertz. Right? It's the fourth significant figure that made a small difference there. So that's why I was putting that. So you'll, you will see there is a different frequency here with the wind blowing than, than here. And then, of course, the hardest one, one we did not do in class, we did not exactly see on the homework, although if you are curious, it is a problem in your book. I'm thinking it's number 62. But, and actually the one they have in your book is even harder than the one I gave you. Uh, but the part C is the bat, as it is chasing moth A, doesn't notice, or maybe I'll say moth B is safe. Moth B was the smart one who 
when it heard the chirping of the bat, landed back into the oak tree and said, I'm staying under this leaf behind it. The bat won't see me. I'm not going to stay out there flying around. So in other words, bat, a moth B is not moving. A moth A is at dinner, you know. It's, it's, it's gone there, okay. But moth, moth B is hanging out on the tree and the sound waves are getting over towards moth B as well. But the bat is not flying directly towards moth B. How do you handle that? Well, let's go back to this derivation. <coughs> if you remember, we got this derivation by saying this is a shift in the frequency because of the movement of the observer. More waves are hitting the observer because there is movement. And in this case, the observer is not moving. So one of the things that we can do here is to say, well, that number, there's not going to be any change in the frequency due to the movement of the observer. The observer is not moving. But there is a movement to the source still. And if you remember that part of the derivation, this was the crunching of the wavelength because there was a movement of the observer. And that's still going to happen, but since the source is not moving directly towards it, it's not going to be the velocity of the source. What will it be? And this is where our mechanics come into play. If I have a vector, which I'll draw it horizontally, that represents 10, but if I had drawn a vector that was up at an angle 10, I bet you would have told me it has a horizontal component of 10 cosine theta. That's how much it's moving on the horizontal direction. Well, same thing here. If I have a bat that is flying this way at 10, I can think of it as how much of that 10 is along the direction of the bat or the, towards the moth, I should say, and then how much is perpendicular to that. The perpendicular part doesn't crunch the waves together as we saw in the little animation. And so the only part I care about is that part, the part that is crunching the waves together. And so that's the added piece. That's the added modification. That's the original thinking, if you will, that I was looking for. How would it affect it? And so on the peak test comes out to be 20,463. In fact, all of them should have been a clue that if you didn't get a number greater than 20, something must be wrong because the everything in here would be more than 20. There's always more movement from this source than movement away from the, the source. So you would expect everything to be greater than 20. Yeah? I used the speed for yellow. 300, uh, 335.8. 335.8. Okay. I like that. Oh, uh, what, what did you, where did you do a point five? Point five. Say that again. What did you do different? So uh, I got the speed three hundred thirty-five point eight. Oh, three thirty. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Three. Yeah. And then that makes instead of whole number, I, instead of using whole number, I, I got slightly. Oh, so did you, did you have this three thirty-five point eight yeah, yeah. minus four? 335.8 minus 12. Exactly, and then you marked it wrong. Oh, and, and I, I, I marked, I marked yeah, it wrong? Yeah. All right. In the, in, the, in the answer, you said a mark, like question mark. Okay, uh, sounds like I owe you points. See me after class. Because I, yeah, I, if, yeah. Bring, Show me after class. Sounds like I owe you some points. If it was just a rounding difference, I, of course. 
If it was more than that, I'll point it out. But uh, and then um, C. Let's see. Did I do green one on the first? Yeah. So let's do yellow on the last one here. Um, no, C. I already did C. Good. All right. So then problem number three. And problem number three, again, has the two parts. It has one, again, nearly identical to what you saw on the homework, and then one that's an uh, added variation to that. But this one also is, well, more so than the other one, is very physics-y, if you will. Uh, you don't know kind of really where to begin unless you see the physical picture. And so I'll start here by saying, the first part says, take a speaker, okay, there's a speaker, make some sound waves, okay, make another speaker, make some sound waves, stand somewhere between them, but not in the middle, the distance between them is 10, you are standing some distance X from the first one, and then of course all your tests x is a little different number there okay but it does make it very clear that that person hears nothing and that's our first bit of physics what would that mean to you you're standing at a node right you have to be destructive interference now to be at a node one wave has to be a crest when the other is a trough right they have to be what we would call out of phase that means if this wave traveled a distance x, and then this wave, which traveled 10 minus x, those two paths, one a little bit longer, 10 minus x, and the other one a little bit shorter, 10 minus x, those difference must be a half wavelength. That's why they're out of phase, right? That's the second little physics -y here thing that you get you got to put in there right it's a half wavelength or it's one and a half wavelengths or it's two and a half wavelengths I would have taken anything with a half wavelength as some some credit here but I think most of us did a, did a half wavelength you could even put the symbol M for the integer and when you do that you get 10 minus 2 X equals lambda over 2 but that's the, the physics part, the path difference. When the path difference is a half wavelength, they're going to be out of phase. And we could even say the same thing, even though we haven't got that far, that's A, the same thing in B. If the path difference is a half wavelength, or one and a half, two and a half, you're going to be standing at a node. And so B is the same physics. Different geometry, but same physics. So. On the yellow sheet, the X is four and a half meters. And so the wavelength comes out to be two meters. And once you know the wavelength, you can then get the frequency of the speakers and that's what you're after but again the hard thing without a doubt was what is the wave length okay and then that comes from our destructive interference that's what you were looking for and I should add don't forget it because we're gonna see the same thing when we get into optics and we get into waves again we're gonna light waves and we're gonna see the same thing again when we get into material waves in our modern physics in chapter 40 so we're gonna see constantly the effect of waves, either constructive or destructive interference. Now, B is a little different <coughs> because instead of the speakers being opposite of each other, they are mounted on a vertical pole some distance D apart. Now on the yellow one, they're five meters, but the other tests have a slightly different numbers. And as they produce sound, there is a person standing over here that is going to get sound from the first speaker, which is 20 meters. 
and the other one is going to travel a distance of 20 squared plus d squared. So it's going to travel a slightly greater distance. And so 20 squared plus d squared for the first distance uh, minus the 20 has to be a half wavelength if we're going to be at a node. Or one and a half or two and a half or three and a half. But again, that's the, the physics part of it. You're standing at a node. Path difference has to be a half wavelength. Now go into the geometry. This one's the easier one where they're in a straight line and you were forced to do it on the homework. This one, a little bit harder. It's off angle. Although I think it was on the review Don did for you, so that hopefully gave you some heads up there. Although I think the one on the review Don did, he had the person walk this way, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but same physics. It's the half wavelength issue. Yeah. Is that a standing wave? No, so I wouldn't call this a standing wave. Um, no, uh, a node is where we always get destructive interference. So, uh, we, we certainly spent the majority of time doing two waves coming together and then talking about this being a node. Because if you were to draw the waves, oh, maybe I'll change colors, if I were to draw the waves here, Um, what's that supposed to be? One, two, and a quarter. The wave in the other direction, this is at a crest, so I would want this one to be at a trough. And the whole reason we get a node there is because the crest here lines up with the trough. And as they travel together, Eventually that crest will get here, but that trough will get there. And so you'll always get destructive interference. The same thing can happen here. Maybe a little bit harder to visualize. But I can draw a wave here. Uh, maybe I made it come out too perfect. Why don't I do it like that? So this wave is a crest. This wave here. will be a trough. And so when they come together and I get the crest and the trough. And if you watch this, the same thing's going to happen. When they, this crest travels forward, this trough will get here. But this trough will travel forward and that crest will get there. And so you're still going to get the same idea. It's just they happen to be traveling kind of at a crossing angle instead of anti-parallel. But you're still going to get a note there. And we're going to do this actually a lot when we get into optics. Very famous experiment called Young's Double Slit. I got to throw it out there just because the, the name is phenomenal, you know. <laughs> 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 Alright, so and there's the... Um, and so finishing the, the, the math here, then once you get the wavelength, which again, you guys all have different values of B. I was doing the yellow one. And uh, the value of D for the yellow one was 5. And if you put that in there, you will get a wavelength of 1.23 meters, which then means the frequency is 343 divided by 1.23, coming up to be about a 279 for the yellow one. And so I'll keep these and tuck them under there. If you want to kind of see the answers to the other colors after the test, fine. We'll uh, set them up. If you want to do it in lab, that's fine. But if you have any questions, uh, come, you know, come see me. Uh, but what I'd like to do now then is move to the next chapter and keep going with our thermal dynamics. Because this next chapter, I think some of you anyways are going to be in for a little awakening here. Our thermodynamics is going to get, I, won't, I shouldn't say hard, but new. Because I would say this first chapter, chapter 19, what did we do in chapter 19? Well, we learned about the Fahrenheit scale, the Kelvin scale, the Celsius scale. I bet you've seen that before you came to this class. 
What else did we do? We did thermal expansion. I bet you saw that before you came to this class. What else did we do? PV equals NRT. So there was a relationship between pressure and volume and temperature, which I bet most of you, there's probably a few, but most of you saw that before you came to this class. So right now, we haven't done really anything new, not to say it was easy. You had some harder problems than you probably saw in Physics 102 and what you saw in your, where else do you do? Oh, you do PV equals NRT like in chemistry. Uh, so you probably saw those, but I'm quite sure that in both your chemistry as well as your previous physics, you didn't do any of this with calculus. And this is your first physics class, first any class outside of calculus that has calculus in it. And so as we go to apply it, you're going to see some of that. Uh, probably not today. We won't quite get to the end of the chapter today, but I'm hoping we'll get pretty far that we'll get into some new stuff. The, the beginning stuff is, is not new. And so, as I begin here in the middle of the board, I will say, let's look at chapter 20. Here's the title. The first law of thermal dynamics. And it's a great title because guess what this chapter is all about? <laughs> the first law of thermal dynamics. What is it? How do we use it, right? And that's what I want to set the stage here for. What is the first law of thermal dynamics? You might be happy to hear that the first law of thermal dynamics is also probably not new to you. First law of thermal dynamics is really the law of conservation of energy. Now, granted, it might be energy in the form of heat instead of potential energy and work like we did in Physics 121, but it is essentially the same thing. It is conservation of energy. And if I can get that across to you, I think your understanding of the first law of thermodynamics will be fairly simple. You'll, you'll realize, hey, this is just conservation of energy. Uh, here's how I like to do the conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics. It's why I left the board over here empty. I want to draw this little picture over here. Let me take and make a box. Let me call this box my system. Well, that sounds pretty abstract, and it, and it is. But my system can be a lot of things. Uh, for example, later on, my system will be this rubbing alcohol. Other times, my system will be the air molecules in here. Other times, my system will be the air molecules that are in here. Another time, my system will be the water molecules that are in here, and so forth and so on. So this is what I mean, my, my system. It's a vague statement to mean, do you mean what? In fact, probably the first one I do will be the simplest of all. I'll just take this little cube of aluminum and say, that's my system. But here's what we mean by the first law of thermodynamics. What we mean is that this system has a certain energy in it. And if you then add energy to it, what will happen to our system? Well, it just is simply saying the change of the energy in our system is equal to what? Well, it's equal to how much energy? In other words, could we gain more energy than we put in? <coughs> no. But likewise, would we have less energy on the inside than what we put in? 
No, that's our conservation of, of energy. Whatever we put in, so however much you measure going in has to equal how much did it grow. Uh, let's take this a step further. How do we add energy to our system? Well, as you'll see in a few moments, simplest way is heat it up. Just put a flame underneath it. And in a second, although it's not that interesting, we'll do it. Take a flame, put it right on there. And that is our system, if you will. It is these molecules and I am adding energy to it. I'm adding heat energy. However, that's not the only thing I can do to it. How else could energy be added? And this is the part will be of most interest to us and get very fun, if you will. I can add energy by doing work on my system. So this first law, again, of thermodynamics is exactly this. It is the law of conservation of energy. It is simply saying, take all the energies that you put into your system, and so in this case, I will say I can put work or I can put heat. Put that into your system. That would be the change of energy. In fact, let's keep going with this because maybe there are two flames. So I would have two of these arrowheads. Also, maybe the hot object now that this aluminum is getting hot, maybe heat will come out of it. And again, we'll do that in a second. We'll first warm it up and then after it warms up, it will cool down. And so we are going to lose energy here. And so I will put an arrow pointing out. Also, my system may do work. Uh, we may lose some energy because my system is actually lifting something up, not just cooling down. Watch. We'll see more of this in, in just a second. But what if I put a little weight on that little piston? That little piston is connected to the air molecules through this hose. What happens if I put them in the hot water? And what is happening is I am then giving energy away from these molecules as it goes into work. I'm also putting it in the hot water. And so in this diagram, what I would be saying is I am putting heat energy into my system. My system then is taking energy out in the form of lifting up that weight. And again, there is my thermal dynamics. I suppose it might be best written as a W for work with a little net. Because my meaning net, I mean, you could put some in, but also some can come out. Heat. The standard symbol for heat is the symbol Q. I think you've seen that before. Did we use the Q in Physics 121? No. Uh, we're going to certainly use it a lot now. And so we'll use a Q. But again, what I mean by that is net. Because again, I could be putting energy in, but it also could be coming out. That would be the change in energy. And so again, I may have multiple heat going in. I may have multiple heat coming out. When I add them all together, that's the net heat. Same thing with the work. And if I add those together, that is the change in, in energy. In fact, to help us with our arithmetic, we like to do this. Heat Q, if it goes in, we're going to label it as greater than zero. In other words, here's my system. And to keep track of the energy a little bit better, if energy goes in, let's call that positive. So if it comes out, we'll call that negative, right? So what we'll have is an accounting system, if you will, that's going to tell me something about the change in energy of my system. Again, first law of thermodynamics. Again, little abstract, okay? 
But that's where we get started here. It is conservation of energy. And again, if I can do nothing more in this first part, it's really to get you a good understanding of this first law of thermodynamics. Because in a minute, we're going to get so bogged down in the detailed calculations of work and of Q, we, we might miss the bigger picture. Keep that bigger picture. That bigger picture is conservation of energy. And for better or worse, we don't like to write the word net. I'm not real sure why, but that's what we imply by that. So keep that in mind, that we'll have positive numbers going in, negative numbers coming out. We'll do the same thing for work. Over here, if the work goes into the system, it's greater than zero. If work is coming out of the system, so in this kind of silly example that I did at first, I would say the Q is positive. I took some hot water, it made the molecules hot. Energy is going in. Q is a positive number. But then those molecules lifted that weight. They did work. They got rid of some of their energy by lifting that up. So here the W would be negative. And so the change of internal energy would be positive or negative depending on which one was bigger. Because here I have a negative W, but I have a positive Q. Let me put a box around it. I'll even put a double box around it. How's that? Because this is how you'll see it written in your book. This is what we will be doing for the rest of the chapter. We will be saying, how does the energy of the system change? The system can change its energy by work or by heat. Either one could be going in, either one could be coming out. Of course, the harder problems is when you've got everything going on at the same time. But that is the first law of thermal dynamics. I'll use the same silly joke that you're tired of hearing. Do you want to know all the answers? <laughs> to all, oh, you figured it out already. I don't even need to tell you. Good. To all the homework problems. Okay, this is the fundamental principle. Now, the details are yet to come, but this <coughs> is the idea. And so the rest of this chapter will be in great discussion of how do you measure and calculate this? You'll see in a moment that we will look at the heat Q and we will have two different ways of adding Q. We will look at the work and we will see we have different ways of adding work and taking work out. I think we'll do it four different ways, uh, three, depending on how you define the last one. Okay. And all of these systems can be adding energy or taking out uh, energy and this is that first law of thermodynamics. So let me leave this here. I, I'm going to leave this here so I can keep referring back to it for the, for the rest of the lecture. I'm going to pull down the overhead here so we can kind of look at some numbers. No. Look at some numbers and a data table out of your book here so we can do some calculations. But to kind of give you a start with our thermal dynamics, Let's do the easy case, and I must admit the boring case, but it's one you did before. We did this problem, and actually the next couple of problems, you already did in Physics 102. Uh, you did something like this. Let's take our system. All right, here's my system. I'm going to take my system. I'll hold it up here if that helps, and say, let's add some energy to it. Let's do the easy one first. The other one is a flame. Let's just take some heat and put it to my system. Wouldn't this increase in its energy? And to illustrate its increase, let's actually measure a temperature. Let me grab a thermometer over here. And maybe without letting my finger touch the gauge, I will hold it on the block of aluminum. And for those of you who are close enough to see, we're looking at about 22.4 degrees. So I can remember it. I'll put that on the board. But I would say, okay, here's my temperature. Call it initial, if you will. 22.4 degrees Celsius. Okay? Now, let's apply our first thermodynamics problem. Let's put some heat into it. Let me take the flame. And hopefully not damage the table or the rag too much, anyways. 
Uh, but as I said, it's not a, the most exciting experiment. But it does set the stage of what we're about to see here is I've added a Q to it, right? <coughs> you will probably recognize the increase in internal energy if we take the temperature again. And so I will place it on the block and the heat it's going to take a while to spread out throughout the block. So I'll hold it here for a while. I'm holding it on the cold side, so the hot side is moving energy over, so it should be going up. I know I don't want to take too much time out of class to watch it go all the way up, but we're just surpassing 50 right now. Why don't we just call it good so we can go on. I'm going to call that 50.1. Okay? And so, what I have seen is the block warm up. I have done, like I said, not the most exciting thermal dynamics, but I, it's my start. I have taken energy and I've added it to my system. You recognize that there's more energy in there because now the molecules are moving faster, which is recorded by the thermometer. Okay. How could I use that? Well, I guess the first thing I would do is apply my thermodynamics. What, what I'm saying here is the Q is equal to the change in energy. Right? There is no W in this case. There's no work being done here. I added energy only purely by, by, by heat. That one we've done. And what I mean by that is we have done what is called specific heat. Not in this chapter or not in this class, but what is specific heat? You guys remember from 102? Yeah, it's a nice way of saying how much energy, so I'll put amount of energy needed to raise one gram, one degree Celsius. And that's why I turned on the overhead. Your book starts right here in the first section, table one, and he says, we are going to be adding energy to our system. One of the easiest way is just to add heat. And the result of that is the molecules will go faster. How much faster is recorded here? Watch. If I look at the first one listed, aluminum, which is what I have, it says it takes 900. 900 joules to warm up one kilogram, one degree. I would probably be more interested in this one since I've got a listing here of how much per gram per degree. Over here it says how much energy 0.215 and instead of using joules they've got calories here but it's per gram per each degree and what it's saying is that's about a fifth right it takes about a fifth of a calorie to warm up one gram one degree that that's what it's saying it's an indication of how much energy is there and that's really what I did I could then use this information which the standard symbol for specific heat is a C the standard symbol for heat energy is Q. The standard symbol for mass is M. And the standard symbol for change in temperature is the delta T. And so our first formula here for thermal dynamics is to say M C delta T. And so if I were to ask this question, how much energy did this little propane torch put into that block of aluminum? Could I calculate that energy? And I claim I could. The first part of it is because I know that the change in energy came only from heat. Nothing from work. That was this first statement. The second statement is saying that I know that all that energy went to warm up its temperature. It didn't go elsewhere. And so I can then put in the numbers. 
Before class, I weighed that block, it was 92 grams. And so that's how much mass I have of aluminum. The specific heat, well, that's why I called up this table. You're going to have to do the same thing as you do the homework and the test. This is 0.215 calories per gram per each degree. And then the change in temperature is why I've got the probe out here so I can measure it. The change would be, and I should ask you, is it 50.1 minus 22.4? Or is it 22.4 minus 50.1? I would go with the top one. Why? And not because I wrote it first. And not because it's final minus initial. But back here, if energy goes into my system, what do I need to call it? Positive. If energy comes out of my system, what do I call it? Negative. So had this been a different problem, had I said that this block started at 50 <laughs> and cooled down to 22, then which order would I want them in? Yeah, the 22 minus the 50, so I get a negative number. Energy comes out of the system, okay? And so again, that's how this little accounting game works. That's how the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy works. Numbers, energies going in are positive. Energies coming out are negative, okay? And so this is the easiest one we can do because there's no W. There's just a Q. And the Q is the easiest Q we can get. It's just a change in temperature. And so I would want a positive number. I'll cross that one out and get out my calculator. And I can then answer that question. So 50.1 minus 22.4 is 27.7 times 0.215 times 92 comes out to be 500. 47, I'll just go 0.9 calories. So grams cancels with grams. This should be degrees Celsius, cancels with degrees Celsius. And we get calories. So 547.9 calories. That's our, our first thermal dynamics problem, if you will. The energy that, that, that went in here. Now, Let's continue with this. I waited a while, so this is already cooled down. It is still kind of warm. But let's just say it's still at the 50.1. What if I then put a piece of brass next to it? What would happen here? There's going to be a movement of energy, right? A heat transfer. We are going to take energy from the aluminum and go to the brass. And if we continue to look at our system right here, right, this would be a losing of energy. Where does it go? To the brass. So this would be a gaining of energy. What's the Q here? Positive or negative? Positive. What's the Q here? Negative. How does the magnitude of this negative compare to this positive? Same. Why? First law of thermodynamics. Conservation of energy, right? Energy lost here is equal to the energy gained there. And so, if I continue with my example and say, okay, you just saw me do this. You saw the Q go into the system. Now, let's take the Q out of the system. Let me kind of clear off the, the board here and say, all right, the second little example here is I have my aluminum, put it next to my brass. There is going to be a Q that comes out of the aluminum. And as you already told me, it's a negative number. But then that means there's going to be a Q, as you said, exactly the same value that goes to the brass, Q of the brass. And if I add those two together, what should I get? 
Zero. It would be like thinking of this as one system. What's the change of energy of the whole system if I group them together as one big system? Zero, right? There should be no change in energy of this whole system. What one loses, the aluminum, the other one gains. Now, of course, I'm kind of assuming here that it's not touching the table. It's all insulated. It's not touching the air. I'll cover it. And even that's not perfect because the, the rag would be getting warm or cold too, or I guess warm in this case. So I'm, you know, overly simplifying it so we can kind of see how does the first law of thermodynamics work here in this simple case. But that's what it's saying. And so if I go to calculate the change of energy of the aluminum, then it would be an mc delta t. If I go to calculate the change in energy of the brass, it too would be an mc delta t. And so there again is our first law of thermodynamics. Then applied with the simplest calculation we can do, which is the Q, the mc delta t. Looking at this, this should be then aluminum as opposed to this one, which should be brass. This should be the specific heat of aluminum. This should be the specific heat of brass. This should be the change in temperature of the aluminum. This should be the change in temperature of the brass. This whole thing should be a negative number because the aluminum is losing energy. This whole thing should be a positive number because it is gaining energy. And they should be equal in magnitude so that when I combine them together, I get a zero. Right? And so if I put those numbers in, this is 92 grams. This, uh, as we had before, is 0.215 calories per gram per each degree. As the aluminum cools down, how would I write the change in temperature? Okay, do I know T final or T initial? I know that once I warmed it up and I've erased it, but it was our 50.1, right? And then T final, I don't know that, right? And that's what happens when I put them together. When I put them together, eventually they're going to get the same temperature. So should I write it as T final minus 50.1? Or should I write it as 50.1 minus T final? Do I want a positive number or a negative number here for my aluminum? Negative. Yeah, as aluminum is cooling down. And so the top one again. Because I wrote it first, I guess. Right? But that would be the, the sign. I, it, it is going to cool down. And I want it to come out to be negative. I want to indicate, using my signs appropriately, that I am losing energy here. And now, as I go to the next step, I can say, all right, let's take the brass. And again, I waited before class, although... I think it's 315. If not, it will be for right now. <laughs> but I think I remember weighing it at 315. So there's the, the mass of the piece of brass. The other thing I would need is the specific heat. So again, finding brass on here, there's brass. It is 0 0.029 uh, calories. It's a, it's a smaller number. Doesn't take nearly as much energy to warm up a piece of brass as it does a piece of aluminum. Although, I have a lot more mass of brass than aluminum. So, it's going to suck up a lot of energy there. Um, and then the change in temperature. What would that be? Good. I want a positive number, and it's going to start at, I'll, can I, I'll just call it 23 degrees. That's what we had in the room. And so as I pulled it over, it's been sitting in the room, then I would have final. So the brass is going to warm up. It's not going to warm up nearly too much as 50, uh, which I think was one of your guys' questions the other day here. Isn't it about um, wouldn't the other object cool down as I was doing it. And I said, yeah, we're going to get to that. It's just next chapter here. And, and then this is how you do that in the next chapter. This is how you find out the, the new temperature. 
It's this object loses energy, this object gains energy because of conservation of energy, because of the first law of thermodynamics, we then know what the final temperature will calculate out to be. Now in the interest of time, let me not get out my calculator and multiply that out. I will say that you might recognize this. All of you had me for physics 102. We did a problem like this, not only in class, but on the homework and on the test. Although it seems to be the hard one for people, so you, you may um, have gotten it wrong. Maybe that was a good thing if you got it wrong. Maybe you remember it. Does anybody remember doing a problem like this in 102? Yeah, a few of you and say, okay, yeah. What is the final temperature? You actually did a lab in 102 where you took the piece of metal and you put it in the cool water and you were supposed to, in that case, I think in that one you were supposed to measure the final temperature and find the missing specific heat, which by the way is what we will do, not this week, but next week. We'll do that and other things in the lab, but one of the, we do is find out what is the specific heat. But I'm hoping I'm getting my point across here without taking too much time to say you, you've done these before. You've done problems with specific heat. You are really your first step into thermodynamics. Now it's the easier part of thermodynamics but it is part of it where you are using the first law by saying heat going in and heat going out, the sum of all the energies equal the change in energies. You use conservation of, of energy. All right. Well, let's keep going because this could have been a little different problem. In fact, your author starts talking about water in its next example and he throws this at you. He says, let's take one gram of water and heat it. Now on his scale, he starts at water or ice, I should say, and he only has one gram. It's negative 30. Now I don't quite have that, but I'll do close to that. I'll take a beaker and I will scoop it full of ice. And after it melts, we'll see how much is there. But usually this comes out to be about 400 grams of, of, of ice. So I, I suspect that's what I have. And then I'll heat it. I'm going to cheat a little bit and put a little water on the bottom because if I don't, the flame gets too hot and cracks the glass. All right, so let's just pretend I don't have any water here for a moment, but I just have a bunch of ice. And I have far more than one gram. I have 400 grams, but this chart is showing one gram and it's negative 30. I don't have negative 30 anymore. In fact, our freezer doesn't get that cold. Our, our, our freezer is at negative 10. But for the sake of discussion, there's one gram of ice negative 30, let's do our thermodynamics. Let's take our system. So this is our new system right here. This very, very cold ice, negative 30 degrees. And what I'm going to do is put heat in it. So I will take my striker, make a little flame. I will put it underneath and I will start to add energy. And that's what this scale is supposed to say here. Here's the scale. And so what we are doing is we are adding energy here. And so at first we would add a small amount, a little bit more, a little bit more, a lot more. But at the same time let's measure its temperature. So what's happening right now I guess would fit under this category of specific heat, mc delta t. I am adding energy. What is happening to the temperature? It's rising, right? Starting at negative 30, goes to negative 25, negative 20, and eventually gets to zero. Ah, what happens now? It does not make the temperature go up. Do you see that? This is the interesting part of this chart. The first part of the chart, what we call section A, doesn't surprise you. That's what we've been talking about for the last few minutes. But the next part, section B, really is something a little different. And now you've seen this before, so again, hopefully this isn't too much of a surprise, but the early scientists threw them for a loop. They said, wait a minute, you just added all that energy from here to here, and the temperature didn't go up. Where'd the energy go? Yeah and it went to breaking the bonds. 
If we take a close look, what would, say, a solid look like? Well, that's kind of why I brought this little box out here. <laughs> if each of those colored blocks is an atom, then they are hooked together. What does a liquid look like? Well, that's why I brought this one out. Here, the molecules are no longer held together. They're slightly held together. You can kind of see that. Kind of pull on each other. Uh, you could even see it if I were to pour the water out of the container. Or pour the water back into the container. And so a solid and a liquid are different. Why? The bonds. The bonds, I would say, are partially broken. Now, I wouldn't say they're completely broken. Aren't they still kind of hooked together? They won't completely break till we get to a gas. What does a gas look like? That's this one again. Here. Those BBs just bounce around. They're not hooked together at all. They bounce off each other, but they're not hooked together. So the liquid to the gas is the bonds com broken completely. But here's my point. My point is that don't forget, especially when it comes to our first law of thermodynamics, where our interest is in energy, not temperature. As we have an ice and water mixed, as we are adding energy, we're breaking bonds. We're not making the molecules go any faster, so the temperature doesn't go up. And I think because the temperature goes, doesn't go up, you may think, oh, there's no energy being added. Wrong. Where's the energy going? Breaking bonds, not into the kinetic motion of the molecules. There's a lot of energy there. It's the whole reason why the early scientists were kind of confused on this step. They're like, wait a minute, we're adding energy, and the temperature didn't go up. Where did the energy go? And so not knowing where it went, they called it a hidden heat or a latent heat. And so B is a latent heat. More specifically, it's latent heat of fusion. It is energy going into our system and yet its temperature did not go up. And like I said, the early scientists just got confused and didn't know where it was going. They didn't know anything about molecules and breaking bonds. They just said, it's a hidden heat. Uh, it's, who knows where the energy is going? It's in there somewhere. But see, that's what's going on right now. I am constantly adding energy from this flame, but its temperature's at zero degrees. All the energy that you've been watching for the last few minutes is breaking the bonds. That is why we call it a latent heat of fusion. And you can even see some of the numbers in here. I mean, this one gram would be, you know, three is the total. And if we subtract 62.7, what does that come out to be? What did I say? 396 minus, did I say 62.7? That would be how much energy, what units are those? Joules? That would be the amount of energy. 396 minus 62.7, 333 joules. And so that's how much energy needs to go into one gram in order to break it. So the symbol we like to use is L sub F. L sub F is just as the name implies here, energy per gram. Maybe we should write it as a Q over an M, or what will be more useful to us is to say Q equals M times L sub F. But there is our second little formula for calculating our thermal dynamics. How much heat? This is for when bonds are being broke. This is what we would call a change of of phase. And I think I've gotten to that point. Yep, looks like all the bonds have been broken. 
Now what begins to happen? I'll call it section C. Now that we have water, what happens? Temperature goes up, right? This is nothing more than we were talking about the last time. This is Q equals MC delta T. Oh, are you adding energy to it? Yes, what happens? Temperature goes up and we can calculate what the energy is when the temperature goes up. So this is how you calculate the energy when the temperature goes up. This is how you calculate the energy when you are changing phase, you are breaking bonds. Uh, perhaps I should have emphasized it back here in A. What happened before we even got to B? Back here. What was going on at the beginning part? Yeah, specific heat again, right? We are warming the ice. This would be a Q equals an MC delta T. And if you go to calculate the energy needed to warm up the ice, that's what you would need. You would need, how much ice do I have? What's the mass of the ice? Um, which, oh good, I have almost exactly 400. I got lucky there. Alright, but 400. All right. But uh, how much ice do I have? And how much is the specific heat? Little word of caution here. The specific heat for ice is not the same as water. Why not? Yeah, it's how they're packed together, right? And the type of bonds they have. When they look like this, they're hooked. When they've melted, they look like this. Since they are hooked together differently. I know they're still H2O, but they're hooked differently, therefore the amount of energy you put in is different. And so as I go back to that chart, well, maybe not do it now, we'll go there in just a second, you will see that the sp specific heat for ice and the specific heat for water are not the same number. And the specific heat for steam is not the same number. The bonds are different and there will be a different specific heat. So the process for A and C is the same, but the process for B is the new one. Uh, a visual picture that helps me is this. If I were to take solid ice, the molecules are hooked together, negative 30 degrees. If I start warming them up, they start shaking more. If I warm them more, they shake. They keep shaking. At some point, if I really warm them a lot, they break the bonds. And it was that energy of going into shaking that broke off the first, then another, then another, then another. And as I keep adding energy, I have to break the bonds. And so they don't really just break all at once, kind of like mine showed. I hopefully I got them to break a little bit as one at a time, one at a time. I keep adding energy and I eventually will get them all to break. And that's what this calculation would do. This calculation is right here. This calculation is, is how much energy is that? And it's quite a bit of energy. But let's keep going. I'm not quite there yet, but after I've done C, I will get to 100 degrees. What will happen at 100 degrees? Yeah, and in this chart right here, this is where the bonds begin to break again. We go from looking like this to shaking so much that they do that, right? And they stop looking like this and start looking like that, right? And now we break the bond. So again, we have what I will call section D here. We have a latent heat again. Now this time since they are breaking off we will call this vaporization. We will use the symbol L sub V but again it too is a measurement of how much energy per gram. 
Uh, I'll put it this way. Q is equal to MLV. Saying this is the energy needed to break those bonds apart. Okay? So we calculated earlier how much it took to break one gram of water. Let's do it again for one gram of water going into a gas. And I'm still not there yet. Yeah, getting too much of a cross breeze, huh? I better not try to lower it. It's going to burn myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> But it uh, doesn't seem to want to get to a boil very quickly here. I think I, yeah, I got too much of a, of a breeze. But it seems like it's got to be close. Oh, yeah, it's close. <laughs> All right. Uh, but if I do some numbers here, let's subtract these two. Uh, so this says that by the time you got here, it was 3,100. Uh, 3,070 joules. Now, when we started breaking the bonds, we had already put in 815. And so, again, if I subtract these two, 3,070 minus 815, I get 2,255 joules. Oh, good, we're boiling to the amount of energy for one bond. And in fact, let me turn this off for a second and go to your table. Here's table number two. This is a table you'll need a lot when you do the homework here. It says, how much energy does it take to? And so we'll see water. Here is water. It says it takes 3.33 times, now this says 10 to the 5, but that's joules per kilogram. So if we divide by a, a thousand, this would be 10 to the 2, so it would be 333, which is the same thing I got off the chart. So it takes 333 joules in order to melt one gram of water. Now, to boil one gram of water, notice the boiling point is at 100 degrees, it would be, and again, divide by a kilo, but that would be 2,260, which is what this is, or this is round to 2,260. And so those numbers are going to become important. They absorb energy here. And of course we have all kinds of other materials listed here, including our alcohol, which we will deal with in just a second here. But again, that change of phase can be very useful. In fact, let's try this calculation. Oh, question David. Okay, well, if we went even hotter, uh, you can see in this case, um, I'm just letting the steam float away. So I can't warm it more than 100 degrees. But on that chart we just had, they actually left a, a big container on it, which is dangerous because the pressure builds up. But assuming you have the right equipment and the right know-how, we could trap the steam, and then once it all became steam, if you kept adding energy, what would happen? Its temperature would go up. Then, and this is your question, at some point we can have another phase transition. We can have another latent heat because we can now break the bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogen and they would separate apart and we, they would pull apart there. And um, again, that would be some other number. Dangerous situation because now you have hydrogen and oxygen and then they can recombine here. And uh, were you getting at the uh, Fumajima uh, power plant? Yeah, that was an example of that phase transition was the uh, tidal wave and earthquake in Japan because th that um, knocked out the power to the nuclear power plant which ran the pumps which circulated the water. So instead of having the water circulate, the water just stayed on top of the nuclear pile and kept getting hotter 
and hotter and hotter, eventually boiled. But then it got so hot it separated into hydrogen and oxygen. And then they burnt and the pressure blew the top off. And so you kind of have nuclear junk flying everywhere. And so I think it happened on the first reaction and then they had to make a decision on the other ones. Do we wait for the other ones to explode and send nuclear crap everywhere? Or do we come in and dump water on there? And so they just grabbed seawater and pumped it through and just kind of let it run through and let some of the nuclear waste out into the ocean. And so that was kind of a, a lesser of the two evils of what could have happened. And they just had to kind of make that judgment call there. Now I want to do a quick calculation here. I know it hasn't all boiled away yet and I don't think we'll, we'll have time or should even take the time to let it all boil away. But could you tell me how much energy it would take to boil all this away? Starting with 400 grams of ice at negative 30 degrees <coughs> boiling it all away, how much energy does it take? Right, and that is our first step in our thermal dynamics. What I'm doing is I am going to increase the energy in my system. But I increase it in multiple ways. I first have to add energy that warms up the ice, then I add energy that breaks the bonds of the ice, then I add energy that warms up the water, then I add energy that breaks it apart. But these four steps are the four steps that I would want. I'll circle those, hopefully reminding me not to erase them, but this calculation a little more sophisticated than the last couple of ones we did because the last couple of ones just changed temperature. These change temperatures and phase. So if I put a Q total, it would be a Q1 plus a Q2 plus a Q3 plus a Q4, right? There's my energy. And so this first part is A. That's my MC delta T. I will write it as an MC delta T. Then I have an MLF. Then I have another warming, MC delta T, but at this point it's a liquid. And then I have another phase transition. And so those are my four terms. So this first term would be 400 grams. That's how much water I have. Oh. LV. Thank you. <laughs> All right. But if I go back to this chart here that lists the specific heat, I do want to point out what I was mentioning earlier. If I scan across here for water, there's the specific heat in either calories or in joules. How about ice? Same number? No. And that's what I was making sure. You don't, don't think that it's supposed to be the same number. And so, since I know the latent heat in joules, uh, let me go ahead this time and use specific heat in joules. So for water it says 4,186, but that's per kilogram. So let me divide by 1,000 and call it 4.186 joules per gram per each, oh that's for water, shoot, sorry. I was looking at water, uh, ice, where's ice, uh, 2,090. So divide by 1,000, 2.09 joules per gram per each degree. Okay, And then how much did I warm up the ice by? 30, right? I know I'm going to warm up the whole thing by 130 to get it to a boil, but just the warming of the ice would be 30. And it would be a positive 30 because I am putting energy into the system. I could do 400 grams as I break the bonds, which is 333 joules for every gram. As I come over to the water, that's 400 grams. That's 4.186 joules for every gram for each degree. How much do I warm up the water? 
That's 100 degrees Celsius. And then finally, how much energy to break the bond, what I call completely, going from the liquid into the gas state. Well, there is 400, and that's what this number was. 2,255 joules are needed for every gram. And let me do this step by step so we can get some intermediate numbers here. But this first one, 400 times 2.09 times 30 comes up with 25,080 joules of energy. Which I know 25,000 sounds like a lot, but this is small compared to the other ones in here. Look at the next one here. 400 times 333. This is quite a bit of energy. Far more energy than it took to warm up the ice. Breaking the bonds does take a lot of energy. You probably noticed that in my experiment. It took a while for me to get all the bonds to eventually break. We looked at it for quite a while. And you can see it's taken a while to boil. So you can imagine how big number this is going to be. And I, I want you to see that. But it does take a lot of, of energy. And that's the whole idea. So never forget that ice and water at zero degrees, they're both at zero degrees, do not have the same energy. Water has a lot more energy. Of course, we get a lot of our water from the mountains. So it's a good idea that this energy does take a lot because hopefully we get some snow. And finally, it looks like we're going to get some snow this weekend as a storm comes through here. Has it rained or snowed in five years or some ridiculous? No, that's not quite that long, but it seems like it. But we're going to get some snow, not here, of course, but up in the mountains, up in the Sierras, and now it will take months and months before all those bonds will break and before that water will melt. And so, fortunately, July will come around and we will still have water coming out of the mountains. Although maybe this year we won't. We're going to run out of snow. We don't have much. But normally, we should have a big snowpack that would take a lot of energy. And it would take a long time before all of it actually melts. A good example I used this morning was the uh, early pioneers or the local ranchers. I'll start with the local ranchers. How do they keep their fruit from freezing in the cold nights as when and if we ever have any cold nights? They spray them with water. Why? They turn on the sprinklers. Now, I'll tell you, the last thing I want to happen to me when I'm cold is get sprayed with water. That doesn't sound like a warming process. But you do that with the fruit. Why? It's not just high specific heat. I mean, we're, we're, we're putting water on there that's pretty cold. The water's going to cool down, but what's going to happen to the water? Yeah, it's just the opposite of this. I'll, I'll go back to this little chart up here. But when the ice is being formed, when we go from water to uh, the ice, as the bonds are hooking together, as we take these two molecules and we hook them together, that's releasing energy. And so as the water begins to freeze around the fruit, it's giving it energy. Now granted, it won't start giving it energy until you get down to zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But the good thing about that is it will keep the fruit at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which for me, that's way too cold. Don't spray me with water. But for the fruit, that's good because the fruit won't be destroyed until it gets down to about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you can keep water on it and you can keep the water freezing, you can keep it above 28. You can just let the water keep freezing, keep freezing. So just run the sprinklers all night long. Early pioneers would do the same thing. They would get some homestead out in Nebraska and winter would come along. They would put their food down there for a winter and it would get cold. And then they would put big tubs of water down there because what would happen is the tubs would begin to freeze. And as they begin to freeze, they would be releasing energy back into the basement. And it would be releasing energy. Now granted, the basement would be 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but it wouldn't get colder than 
32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the nice thing about having it around. It can keep freezing. That's the nice thing if you're an Eskimo. You don't live inland of what I'll today call modern Alaska. In the winter, you go to the islands. You let the water around you, which you know is warmer than 32 or beginning to freeze and as the water around you freezes and the ice gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker it keeps you in your little hut at 32 degrees Fahrenheit which again I'm not sure I would want to live in my little igloo at 32 degrees Fahrenheit but at least it is a lot warmer than if you were in the inland areas of uh, Alaska and so that is this latent heat here all right well, it's a big number and it can go a long way. I'll keep going. In fact, I want you to notice that this number is a hair smaller than this one. But it is about the same. In other words, it takes almost as much energy to break the bonds as it does to warm it up. It's why if you exercise and you want to cool your body, ice chips are great. Snow cones are fantastic because ice by itself is not that great. But you put a little uh, food coloring on it with a little bit of flavor and now those ice chips go into your body and your body has to break all those bonds. That can cool you very quickly. Ice cream, the same thing. It's got little chunks of ice. It can cool you really quickly. And it's got other things in it too. So ice cream's even better than a snow cone. But besides the taste, the thermal part of it is really powerful. Lots of bonds that can be uh, broken there. And uh, ice chips far more than just cold water. If I drank cold water, I would just have to warm it up 37 degrees. Zero degrees, 37. That's not nearly as much energy as breaking the bonds. Here is 100 degrees warming. And so if I go 100 times 400, times 4.186 I get just a little bit more than the energy I put into breaking the bonds and that's what I was trying to convey again if I were to just drink ice water this number would only be 37 I would be much better off if I wanted to take some body heat away to get the ice chips and breaking the bonds. Of course that's not really the best part about getting water because whether I get my water by ice chips or whether I get it by just having some cold water which then goes inside me and warms up that's not the major cooling process. What happens next? And in this experiment it boils away. Look at the size of this. This is 400 times 2255 902,000 joules of energy there. Far more. You can see why it has taken so long for this to boil away. And I'm not even there yet. I've only boiled away half of it. I've had 400 and now I'm still at 200. So I've got a long way to go to get this much energy. I've only put in half of this. Because this is a calculation based on all 400 boiling away. I, I think it'll all boil away. We still got, what, 25 minutes. But it's taking a long time for all that energy to get into my system because it is such a big number. Again, back to the human body. This is how your human body, how does your human body cool itself? You sweat. How does sweating work? It evaporates. What are you doing to the bonds? Breaking. That takes lots of energy. Uh, so again, whether you drink cold water or whether you do ice chips, the big thing is to get hydrated because if you're hydrated your body then will sweat it out and most of the energy is taken away from your body right here. This is huge. This is a lot of energy. That's the, the point. If you're a dog you don't sweat. Instead you you pant. So, so what's the dog trying to do? How, why does panting work? How does the dog cool itself really? Yeah, it's that. <laughs> Don't try it in public. It's kind of embarrassing. But <laughs> if you try it for just that small moment as I do, I could already feel my tonsils getting cold. I am making the air rush back and forth. Oh, you're trying it, huh? Okay. That's, but as, the, as the water evaporates out, 
it is breaking these bonds and leaving behind it then less energy. And so again, it's using that latent heat. Um, you're not adding it to your body, you're taking it away. So in my thermodynamics picture, I would say when I am sweating, I'm doing this. I'm starting here and the energy comes out. It's this part of the puzzle. It's not coming out because of the MC delta T. It's coming out and it's fusion here in this case. Oh, nope. Vaporization. In this case, it's the sweating of the body or the evaporation from the dog's bronchial, are they still bronchial tubes in the dog and lungs or they have a different name? They probably are. Alright, anyways. But something inside and it's bringing out the, uh, the moisture and that would be my thermal dynamics. And so in this picture, if we kind of put the two together, we might actually say, and this sounds funny, boiling is a cooling process. What? Yeah, boiling is actually a cooling process. Why would I say that? Because for me to take this water and turn it into a gas, I got to put that much energy into it. Now I know most people don't think of boiling as a cooling process because what else am I doing at the same time? I got a flame underneath it. So right now I have something that looks like this. I've got energy coming in from the flame, a Q, and then I got it boiling away, taking the energy from it. What if I had something boil or evaporate without energy going in? That's what your human body does. Your human body allows it to evaporate without adding energy in. So evaporation, sweating is a cooling process. Panting is a cooling process. You might see it here if you've ever used any rubbing alcohol. What happens if you spill a little rubbing alcohol on your hand? <laughs> what do you notice right away? It feels cold. Is that because the rubbing alcohol was cold? I mean, let's try this. I will take and put the thermometer in there and convince you that the liquid itself is not cold. I mean, it's been in this room since 8 o'clock this morning. And even that, it was in that room for the last decade, I think. Okay, So, so it is at 20.9 degrees. That is the temperature of that. If I pull it out, so this is like my hand, and I have a little alcohol on my hand, what begins to happen? And what happens to the temperature? 13.9 degrees. It just dropped 7 degrees Celsius. Why? Evaporation. A cooling process. This would be our thermal dynamics. We would say here that this is my system. A container of rubbing alcohol. And what happens is heat is taken out of it. Heat is taken out of it through a process called evaporation. It would ca be calculated this way. Watch this one. I think this one's a fun one to see. It's the same physics, so I don't know, maybe it won't do any good in terms of the education. But it's one that I think every student should see somewhere along the line. This is water. It's not rubbing alcohol. It is water. It is water in a container that is hooked to a giant vacuum pump. And although I say giant, it's not nearly as big as it should be to do this job right. But what's going to happen is I'm going to turn this on in a moment and this hose is connected to this container and it's going to take out the air. Well, so what? Ah, let's talk about why something boils for a moment. I mean, you see it boiling over there. Why is that boiling? Why are the bonds being broken? Why is it going from a liquid into a gas? Because the vapor pressure is equal to the atmosphere. Oh, okay, agreed. But I guess I was after something a little different. Yeah, what I've done is I have made them go fast enough that they've broken the bonds. And so in other words, what's holding them together is the bonds and the atmosphere. The air in this room right now is holding the water down. And so for me to make that boil, what I have to do is get the molecules moving fast enough that they will both break the bonds and overcome the air pushing down on it. I say that because what if I took the air on top of it away? 
I wouldn't have to warm it nearly as much to break the bonds, right? In other words, the boiling temperature is dependent on the air pressure. That's why I have that pump in there. Because if I turn on that pump and I take away all the air, 5 degrees Celsius is enough speed to break the bonds. And this room is far warmer than 5 degrees Celsius. So I claim that I can get water then to boil if I just take away the air. I don't have to really heat it up. And that's what you'll see here. If I come over here and turn this on, you'll see the pressure going down, 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 down as I take out the molecules. And it's kind of getting started. A little bit more. But soon, you will see, oh, and I should have noticed the temperature, 20.6, okay? But as we drop in pressure now, the molecules on the top are breaking free. Notice the boiling looks a little different. These are coming off the top. What did they happen over here? They came off the bottom. You see it's the molecules at the bottom that are going the fastest because that's where the flame is. They break free and they make kind of like a little bubble, but I don't want you to think it's an air bubble. It is H2O molecules in the gas state and then they rise to the top. Whereas over here, I'm not putting any heat in it. The ones that break free are the ones on the top. Of course the ones on the top. The ones on the top are the ones that don't have the air holding it down. And so they are breaking the bonds. And the thermodynamics part of this is when I come over here and I have my system and I'm taking heat from it, I'm taking energy, what do I get left with is less energy. That's the first law of thermodynamics. That less energy should show up as less temperature. And so this is a cooling process. Boiling is a cooling process. Again, most of the time when we boil we have a flame underneath it so we don't think of it getting cooler, we just think it's not getting hotter. We add energy, boils off. We add energy, boils off. Stays at 100 degrees. But that boiling is a cooling process. Without a flame, you can see the cooling process. Have we gone down yet? Ah, 19.5. So not much, but we have gone down by one degree. And so as this is coming off, this is a good illustration right here of that latent heat. Taking it away. And don't forget the opposite occurs. You're going to see it this weekend. Like I said, we finally got rain coming in. First time in 21 years or some ridiculous thing. All right. Okay. And so as the rains come in, what's going to happen to the moisture in the air? Condenses. Water falls. Ah, condenses. Think about the energy. When it condenses, what's going to happen? It's going to give off that energy. And so all of this energy that we calculated needed to go in to make it boil or evaporate is now going to be released. And so as our storm comes in here the next couple of days, you're going to get things like wind, driving wind, cloud formation, movement of air, and you are going to get stuff moved around. And that movement around is the energy associated with this. Ah, 18.8. Oh, close it off there, but that's this whole idea of this second option we have. How do you put energy in or take it out? So far I've only shown you the Q, but we can do it with a temperature change or a phase change. Yeah. So then this explains why refrigerators have coolants then? Because it's giving off heat when it freezes the water. Oh yeah, yeah. When you put when you put anything into the fridge, you know, you go to the the store and you buy a new mayonnaise jar, you know, it's all sealed, you don't have to have it cold. As soon as you open it, ah, you put it in the fridge. Well, now you've got to take energy out of that mayonnaise. You put ice in the or water in the ice trays and you close the door. Now you got to take energy out. And there's a lot of energy that has to come out of that ice. So the jar of mayonnaise probably doesn't have to take many much much energy out. With, probably within a half hour, you'll realize, hey, the mayonnaise is nice and cool. But the ice, you're like, okay, it's not ice yet. It, it may be 10, 12, 14 hours later. Uh, maybe that's a little long. But it'll take a while before the ice forms because it does have to take a lot of energy out. And the mechanism, how it works 
let's wait and we'll design a refrigerator next couple of chapters, but you do recognize the heat coming out. If you've ever stood barefoot, you'll feel the machine blowing hot air. And that's what it's, it's done through a process we'll discuss, but it's taken the heat out of the mayonnaise or out of the water, put it in the Freon, put that through a blower, and now it's putting it into your kitchen and you stand there barefooted feeling the blow the hot air blowing out. Now I better shut this off before I run out of all water and I crack the glass there. So but there I boiled away probably about 325 grams so it wasn't quite the full 400 but there's my start anyways of my 400. Well let me keep going because I suspect then that what I've shown you so far, you have already seen. I know that we did all this stuff in Physics 102. We probably didn't do it quite as detailed of a discussion in terms of the mathematics, but let's look at something else here. Let's take a system and add energy, not by heat, but by work. Watch, the first one that illustrates this well. I lost my lid. First one that illustrates this well is this two liter bottle that you've been looking at, or maybe you've been looking at it sitting up here. This two liter bottle is filled with air. This is my system, if you will. And I bet it wouldn't surprise you if I took that two liter bottle, call it my system, and I put a flame near it. Maybe not too close, I don't want to melt the plastic, but if I put a flame, I would add energy and its temperature would go up, right? And you'd say, well, not a surprise, you added energy. You added energy by heat. But what I want to illustrate is I could add energy by doing work. Now, maybe it's hard to see this, but this bicycle pump is connected to the two liter bottle. If I lift it up, there is a plunger here that I can push down and squeeze the air that is in that container. You might say it looks a lot like this, but on a bigger scale, if I take a rod, put it in a bore and I push down, I am squeezing it. I am doing work on it. Force times distance. That's work, right? And so, unlike heating it with a flame, could I add energy by doing work? Yeah? I will start with the thermometer showing you that the temperature in here is 22.5. If I then push on the air, I get a temperature of 23.8. I have added energy. I have added energy not by the simple case, but what I'll call the more advanced case. And I'll say advanced just because I don't think you've done this in too many of your classes, if at all. What if I do it again? And again. And again. And every time I squeeze it, I'm doing work. I am adding energy. What's the temperature now? 28. Ah, that's nothing. Again, 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 right? And so I'm adding energy to my system. I'm at 34. Let me go up to about 50 pounds of pressure. So I'm doing work. I guess I'm also adding molecules in this case, so it's not a completely uh, ideal case of a, of a system. But I am now at a pressure of about 50 PSI. In fact, I can fill it kind of tight. Oh, I can even fill it nice and warm. And it's 35 degrees. And so it has warmed up. And so this one is an illustration of I can add energy 
not just by heat, but also by work. And now, as I talk for the next 10 minutes, my system's going to do what? It's going to release energy by heat. This is pretty warm. This is much warmer than the room. It went up to 35. It probably has already cooled down a little bit. Yeah, see, it's already down to 29. And so it is losing the energy that's in it by heat. Of course, that one doesn't surprise you because losing energy by heat is one we've already been doing here. But this one, I hope, is a new surprise to you. This is the one that I say, look, we can add energy in many ways. Watch, this small one is a fun one to do. Because on a smaller scale, compared to this big one, I can do percentage-wise more work. I'm going to put the piston in here and shove it down on those molecules. And I can shove it really, 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 really small. And so it's not much total work. It's probably just, you know, 10, 20 joules of my effort. But all of that is in a small amount of air. So unlike this, where I did a lot of work on a big air, it only went up to 50 degrees. What do you think would happen if I put that same amount of work into a little bit of air? Right, it should go up a lot higher. And in fact, this one will hopefully go up so high that it will exceed the burning point <laughs> of paper. And so I will put my piece of paper down there. I will put the little plunger. I will tighten it up to get a good seal. And I will, like this one, do work on it. And again, illustrate something that's a little more advanced and it's a little harder to calculate. We won't have time to calculate it today. That's what Thursday's lecture will be on. But I can put energy into this and it will show up as heat. And in this case, it'll show up as a lot of heat. In fact, so you can see it maybe a little bit better. We'll kind of power down a couple of lights. I guess we still have the, uh, those on. But I think, although it's not very dark, You'll still see it because this is really bright here. But if this catches on fire, you will see it. Now, let me just hold it so I don't block your view. Can you guys still see it under my hand? All right. And so if I do work, it will catch on fire. And so I've done work and converted it into heat, right? Uh, watch this for a moment here. Now that you're seeing the bigger picture here, that you can add energy either by Q or by heat, let's look at the other side. The other side is, could you take energy out of your system? Could you take it out as heat? Well, yeah, that's kind of boring. We've seen that. Could you take it out as work? That's where it's going to get interesting. I mean, that's what this crazy little contraption is here, actually. If you look at this little piston here, and it might need a little readjustment here. Uh oh. Let me. I, I think that's enough air. Let me let me let me see here. But here's the idea. If I take this as my system, could I make my system do work? Could energy come out of it? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put that in hot water. Heat is going to flow in. Then the fast moving molecules are going to lift the piston up and do work. That's the usefulness of this chapter in our first law of thermodynamics. I will take these and put it in the hot water. Oh, and I'll put a weight on it. Uh-oh. Lift, 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 lift. Not much lifting. Bummer. I let the water cool down too much. I left the lid off. 
but in the short time we have left let me also adjust the air pressure in here and we can at least get something out of this but here's the idea that if I put a weight on here and actually let me do one more thing since I let my water cool down let me readjust when it's in the cold bath okay alright so if I put a little weight on here here's the idea if I then submerge it into the hot water I am adding thermal energy Q I'm adding heat to my system my system then using those molecules and the motion of those molecules push the weight up and the whole reason we kinda have these stands here is so that then I can say hey that's the work I did I lifted it up if I then cool it down taking the thermal energy out of my system by Q I can then put a second weight and lift it again and so I have hopefully built what we will call here in our thermal dynamics a machine a way of taking heat energy and making it do work if this was your car it would operate this way you would have a piston that eventually is connected to the wheels what you do is you add thermal energy you burn gasoline so I burn gasoline it does work it pushes the car after it pushes the car you open the valve get rid of all the gasoline in this case I will cool it down to get rid of the energy and then I will warm it up again and so I am doing work in this case I am hopefully showing you how do I take my system and make it lose energy by work and in this case it's getting its energy by heat one more quick one and then we'll go here let's come back to this one I hopefully talked long enough that if we come back to this system we will see its temperature went back down to room temperature it is it's a what 21.9 degrees and what I did just to review before we got here is we started with a system and what I did is I did work fair enough that gave it energy we saw its temperature go up I then left it alone so I was talking while I was talking energy came out of it in the form of heat and it was kind of warming up the room however could I have taken the energy out by work yeah that's why I left it under a high pressure because this is at a pressure still of oh it dropped down to 40 psi but some of it leaked out but it's still at a pressure it's 40 psi and that means if I pull the cork that's holding it what would happen to the air in here yeah what's gonna come rushing out it's going to be pushing it's going to be doing work it's sort of like this little experiment here now this experiment pushes a weight up so I think you can see the work better this one as it comes rushing out has to push all the air molecules away so don't forget that there's air molecules in here and for this gas to come rushing out it's got to push those back it's got to do work and so this should be losing energy because it does work when I pull that cap off so we will hopefully notice that in a temperature change the whole reason I waited this long is because if I had opened it back when it was at 35 degrees then the 35 would have just dropped back down to room temperature and you wouldn't have been impressed but since I waited long enough for this to cool down to room temperature and that's we're now at about 22 degrees if I open that stopper or if I open that cork then as it does work on the atmosphere its internal energy is going to go down so what's going to happen to its temperature it's going to go down and it will hopefully go down dramatically let's keep an eye on what it goes down to and, and it all, this happens quickly if it gets low enough 
the water molecules in here may condense. I may get a little what I call fog in the bottle, cloud in the bottle. And so look at this. Look how transparent this bottle is right now because it should cool down enough and it should get cloudy. That's the condensing of the water molecules. And then look at the thermometer here. I wouldn't surprise me if it said like five degrees Celsius or something real cold as it does the work. And here's how you pull the cork off here. So one, two, three. There's the cloud. There's the temperature, three degrees Celsius. And so it is doing work. And so far more interesting and far more challenging in our thermal dynamics is going to be this part of the puzzle. And so hopefully you saw this. You saw heat come in and heat go out. All right, boring. You did that before you got to this class. What's new here, with a lot of calculus in a minute, is heat come in making work. That's what we really want. Burn the gasoline, make the car go. Right? This is kind of boring, but still useful. Do work, make some heat. All right, we'll warm a room or something. Okay. All right. More on this on Thursday. <laughs>